and when they're treated on ice or give sway, some of these cars up there or a piece of township equipment is lost over the hillside. Um, another issue I'm concerned about is flooding. All the water from McDonald Drive, Woodall, Kelso, Martin Drive drains through those backyards into the park down over the hillside and there's a natural creek down there and they're about 10 feet away from filling this creek in. I'm not an engineer, but that water has to go somewhere and that's gonna cause some big flooding issues, I don't believe. Um, at the other end, other end of the stump, there's also a natural spring. Um, you know, people for generations have played in there. I talked to people, they call it uh, Blizzard Falls, Snake Creek, Salamander Land. We're about to lose it. It's fun to all these people, but more importantly, that feeds the wetlands, it wanders through the park, feeds the wildlife. And, um, and I think that's a concern that has to be addressed. That we don't know what's down there with that hillside and we're dumping stuff. So, um, aesthetically speaking, our parks are for relaxing. Um, who wants to relax somewhere next to a landfill? If you were going on a vacation somewhere and you were planning a trip, you would not you know, book a trip in the hotel that to get from the hotel to the pool, you had to pass the landfill. That's what our park is going through right now. Um, legally speaking, my grandparents' generation, a lot of which still live in the neighborhood, and they're up in arms about this, um, they had the foresight to put the words always green and for recreation only in the deed to the park when they handed it over to the township. This landfill is neither green or recreational. And uh, I think legally you're probably in violation of that. Morally, I'd like to know the point of teaching our kids. We inherited a park and we're leaving them to We need to teach them a little bit better. We need to teach them about recycling. A lot of what's going down over that hill, the metal pipe, the plastic pipe, could all be recycled. Um, we're just being a terrible example. We need to be a better one. Um, our citizens have really rallied behind us pretty quickly on a petition. Um, just in case 200 people filled this petition out. They weren't all North Huntington residents, but a lot of them were, and they had some pretty important things to say. Um, I'd like to read a few of them if I could, two or three. Um, There's 11 pages. Um, one of them says, this speaks volumes to me as a resident. It means our elected officials and public works departments do not care for our children. It's bad enough our parks are bare fenced minimum to begin with compared to other communities near us. Now they dump their garbage in and near the parks we do have. My five-year-old can tell you why this is not acceptable. These adults who think this um, is okay should be embarrassed. It's not just important, another person says, it's not just important for me, it's important for the community and nature. As a general taxpayer, go dump a truckload of tires, plastic, and other non-biodegradable products on the field and see the same hypocrites aren't beating toward the door with warrants, citations, and fines out the rear. And uh, as township leaders, we should be making green choices and leaving residents to just smart choices, not trashing up the park. Has anyone looked at the ramifications of these choices? The alleged list of issues resolving from this choice in the petition should be enough to have you immediately cease and seek alternate dumping grounds. You should be leading the people in a positive amount. We don't know why our park was chosen for this stuff, but we would like to have it. Um, our neighborhood is experiencing revival. Uh, the kids who grew up here are coming back to give their children what they had growing up. And we want to work together to get it back to where it once was, the center of the community, and we're willing to pitch in to make it happen. Uh, but our park, our people work on our park's only asset. Uh, there's a huge amount of history in this park. The northern border was actually the trolley line that connected Earl to Trafford. Um, if you walk through the park today, you can still see where this tra track went through. You can still find the insulators from the trolley line. Um, the southern edge of this park was an airfield for the U.S. Air Mail. Um, these are things we should be monopolizing on, you know, selling to the people, showing off to our community. We should be bearing it. Um, there's huge amounts of nature. I know Rice Girls, famous for its blue eyed Marys. But I would say Hilltop Park has much more diversity. We could be right up on that park with them instead of the landfill. Um, in conclusion, you're probably wondering what we would like to see done. I would like to see all those millions taken out of there as 
as much of that pipe sticking out as possible, remove as many of those tires removed as possible. Um, if the fence is going to stay there, put something behind it worth protecting. Um, yeah, that's kind of a dream of mine. I'd like to see that Adam Sam house move down there. I know a group of gardeners who would love to put a project around that. Um, the historically accurate garden or garden, vegetable garden. But if that's not going to happen, if it's not a possibility, if the fence up, just find some wildflowers. We definitely don't want to come. I have some photographs of <laughs> what the dump looks like. I don't know if any of you have seen what it looks like underneath that hillside. It's frightening. Um, I have CDs if you would all like to take a look at them. I have a uh, copy of the petition and a copy of the deed if you guys would like to discuss it. Um, but I think the deed is a big, big issue. So. misrepresentation or gives a gives the impression uh, that I don't think is quite accurate. We don't have a waste problem at Hilltop Park. We have a resident concern based on public opinion, based on some insightful terms like dumping waste, dumping refuse, a garbage dump, illegal dumping, a landfill. Some of this was aided by the, the media coverage, which reused some of these terms. This Filling practice occurs throughout the region in parks, and we've done it in the township in a number of places. And it's true, at Penns Woods Park and at Lions Park, we increase some parking there. It doesn't have to be parking, it can be whatever you want. Since this has become such an issue, and, I, and we appreciate the passion for Hilltop Park, we're giving you our opinion. You're going to make a decision, and we're going to honor the majority's opinion, and we're going to move on. But I just want you to know the times is position. We've since reviewed this with all of our management staff, our engineers, our public works, and we find this practice to be acceptable. 
We've looked at it with a consulting engineer that works in numerous communities and find this to be a common practice. We reviewed it with our comprehensive plan consultant that sees this regularly as an accepted practice in regional parks in the region. We had the president of Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful here and went and looked at the site and found it to be acceptable and she also oversees a illegal dumping program. It's relatively easy for us to pick out the pieces of pipe and things that made its way there that shouldn't have happened and definitely was careless. We intend, if we move ahead with what our plan has always been, to clean up the rest of it. The extent of this is, is somewhat limited. The bottom from the toe, current toe of the slope would probably be about 20, extended 20 feet and the top 10 feet. So the extent of this, the hillside will be extended out about 10 feet. That's the limit of it. The alternatives that were proposed created a number of problems and inefficiencies and in discussing these extensively with public works and our consulting engineer did not favor these. The idea that this was not known I don't believe is quite accurate. I went back to the May 2016 meeting minutes and two commissioners pointed out that this area was used for fill and the garden concept was being discussed. In fact, the, the, uh, the plan to have a lock put on there and a key became an issue because the township would need a key to get in there for the purpose of placing fill. We need a place to waste fill. Our recommendations have not changed. We would prefer to use Hilltop Park and then go to Public Works when we have that ready. Of course, we'll honor, we'll honor your, the majority's preference um, but I think some of this is a little bit overstated. Let me take a couple of those. The safety matter, uh, kids going over the hill, there's a hill there now. Could we do some things there? I, I, I think we could. Uh, it doesn't have to be a parking area, whatever we end up doing there. The idea that uh, the, our engineers looked at the uh, hydrology and the flood doesn't think there's a problem if we would intercept the spray or something like that. We could easily convey it through the area. The hydrology is not going to change, we don't believe, nor the flooding. The legal issue is not, I mean, most of the parks have a concept of grid. It doesn't mean we can't move earth around or if we did a project at the park, we would move dirt, okay, like what we did at Lions Park, we cleared out a whole hillside of trees to use to fill a building embankment there. We plan, eventually planted grass over it and greened it up. So I'm not concerned with that matter myself. Maybe Bruce would chime in on that if he wants to, but um, the, 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 it was said that we were dumping truck tires. The township doesn't need dump tires there. We have a way to dispose of our tires. That wasn't us. I think we can go in and clean it up. I think we can extend it out about 10 feet. We can use it down the road. We'll green it up. I think we can do a little better job with some of our practices. I'm confident we can do that. But like I said, there seems to be a lot of passion around this issue. And I think it's just really a matter for you to decide. We want you to know we believe there's some ramifications to our public works operations if we don't go here. Thank you, Uh Yeah, I wanted to ask Bruce. Bruce, what is the uh, stance on the deed? What would be the validity of the deed? Well, it, it says that you will maintain it green. Well, I just saw it. There's no ramp. It doesn't say that if you don't do that, there's a reversion to the owners. There, it just says you will do this. Um, I haven't heard anything that says it's not right. I'm hearing uh, what Mike has, has described as a situation that's occurred over, I guess, decades, a period of time. Where, uh, the township has used this as an area where you put fill. You know, I, I think the pipes, the tires, those kinds of things should be removed. I mean, those certainly aren't the kinds of things that you would expect to see in a, in a clean fill area. Um, other than that, I don't know what I can think might hit most of the nails. I don't think the condition in the D has been violated. That's what I'm saying. Even if it is, I'm not sure there's any remedy. Let's assume you wanted to build up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have, ordinarily, you, you would see language like that and they would say that if there's a violation, then there's a reversion of the title to this to somebody else. 
that's not there. That's not to say that the uh, prior uh, seller couldn't bring some sort of action to say, keep you in line and tell, you, tell the past court to say, clean it up if it's a, in a situation where it really is messy. There's, there's certain things that alarm me about this issue. Um, before we started dumping there, before we started putting material there, did anybody go down there and actually look at the lay of the land? Were any trees cut? Was a keyway put in? I know we put some extra uh, material on the roadway to prevent the trucks from sinking because that was pretty wet there. So I know we did that. But in this day and age, with recycling the way it is, if I would put a piece of, if I would dump my truck full of stuff in my backyard, code enforcement would be in my house. We need to recycle. Well, I, 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 Rich may want to add on, because he's going to be more familiar with, he's going to be more familiar with some of the particulars, but as far as what we put there, I mean, we can disturb so much ground before we have to take, I think it's 5,000 square feet, and he said we have some leeway to do some. I mean, they're not, we don't have to get an approval for every bit of ground we move, or so we can do a certain amount of uh, dumping there. Fill, but but, but, but we're, we feel like we're probably getting close to that, so we need to put some erosion control measures and formalize it. And that's the plan. That's what it's in design right now to, to design a keyway there to stabilize the tow of it. So so we're going to do all that. We didn't have to do that before we start dumping some truckloads there. And I will say this: that it's going to taper off here a little bit uh, because we're getting through some of the busy time. As far as lo looking, re re recycling is always a good idea. But maybe Rich can comment a little bit more about how the particulars of how. How, how, how they looked at the site or anything was to add to that. We do recycle. We've always recycled our pipe for many of years. If you go down into our yard at Public Works Department, you'll see by the salt shed, behind our salt shed, there's two large stockpiles of pipe, plastic pipe and metal, corroded metal pipe that we separate while we're doing our work. As um, Mr. Turney had said, you know, maybe our guys got a little careless lately. Uh, I'll take a lot of that blame because I'm always pushing these guys to try to get work done based on the fact that we're doing you know more work than we ever have before in the past you know as, um, as he had said or maybe we got a little careless we went down there we cleaned as much as we could over the hill um, moving forward we're certainly not going to let that happen again and whenever we go ahead and, and do the improvements to do the stabilization as Mike had mentioned we'll be able to continue to pick up the rest of the refuge that's over the hill. Um, that's not a common practice of ours to throw the, the, the pipe over the hill. The plastic pipe's not even an issue. You can throw, I mean, aesthetically, it's not pleasing to have that plastic pipe over the hill. Um, we find that out, there's nothing wrong with that. The metal pipe, the, the issue with the metal pipe is the rust, that it want the, the rust to um, absorb into the soil. As far as the concrete culverts and so forth that go over, that have been pushed over the hill, um, aesthetically it's it's not pleasing to look at. Um, it could be a safety issue if a, if a child would happen to go over that hill, but there's no rebar in there. Like Mr. Arvin said, if there is, it wasn't something that we had dumped on there. Uh, all of our concrete culverts that we build, we never use rebar or any kind of metal or any kind of metal materials in it. We pour solid concrete even the ones that we purchase. So um, whenever this project's done, if, you could, if the board goes ahead and approves what we're proposing to you this evening, uh, it'll be better than what it is now. Whenever we cut the, the key in there, put the bench in there, do the drainage, clean up, it'll be a two to one slope. We can, we'll put vegetation on it, we'll, make, we'll put trees on it to make this gentleman happy out there, and it'll be in much better condition than it is right now. In the interim, it not only helps us be able to continue moving forward um, in efficiency, and it's also providing future development for an apartment, whatever it may be. Move your house, log cabin there, or plant a garden, etc. I mean, if we hadn't done like we have over the years, 
we certainly wouldn't have the space where they're proposing to put a garden in the future. I want to just clarify. I think Rich, when he said it's the pipe's not a problem, it, we don't want to dump it there. I think what, he, what he's to clarify, a, a pipe goes underground naturally if your car is covered. It's not a problem necessarily. We're not. Right. I don't want to place pipe there. We don't want to leave it unsightly. It, it might be dangerous and it's unsightly. And I and I agree with you, the gentleman. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it being there. It's not illegal to have that plastic pipe there. Um, the metal pipe, if it's rusted, which in most cases it is, that's why we're taking it out of the ground in the first place, um, there's issues with the rust. It, it's not illegal, but if, if we're saying that plastic pipe is okay to dump over or to throw over the hill, and we can continue to throw it over the hill, it's not biodegradable. It's not going to go away. It's not, Mike. It's not, the, the that's what I'm saying. We need to have a plan to recycle. We have a, we well, do that, right? We recycle, we take it to the scrapyard. We take this metal pipe, it okay. goes to the scrapyard, and our plastic pipe goes to the landfill. I'd be glad to take you down after this meeting and show you two big piles that are down in the I And I've also, you know, I, I know in the past, in the 90s and maybe in the 2000s, early 2000s, there's there's actually a uh, park slide down there. I mean, there's some material down there that was from way before, from 10, 15 years ago, maybe even oh, longer. Sure. And, and I can tell you, if there was any structure that was to be built on that area, it would have to be done on pylons. It could, you couldn't put a permanent structure on there, but if, to use it for a garden or uh, a dog park or et cetera, et cetera, it's certainly, Good enough to use for I think yeah, we're not going to put a structure there. No place for that, but we're not going to be dumping pipe there. Yeah, that's that's, 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 that's going to be practice. It, we were careless, and as Mike said, when we move it forward, we'll see too that, that doesn't happen, but that's not a common practice for us. We recycle. We have recycled for years. So the plastic pipe? The plastic pipe and the metal pipe. Because of course, the metal goes to the scrapyard. We get nothing for it. We get no no money for it whatsoever. What we get for it, uh, we get rid of it for free, and not have to truck it as far to go to the landfill, and um, you know, and they get rid of it for us um, because of the rust. So they won't give us any money for it. But the plastic pipe it goes to the landfill. What about waste management? Waste management give us a a dumpster to put it in and have them pick it up. Anybody ever gone to waste management and asked them if they would take plastic and metal, just like we give it to them and our recycling ever do? Well, I mean, in order to get a dumpster, even us, we pay for a dumpster. It sits down there, I mean, and we pay for a dumpster. Ask if we can make an agreement with them. That's what I'm saying. You want it goes to the same place. It goes to the landfill. You're talking about a recycling dumpster. Yeah. I, we can. I, I, I think we're going to get a dumpster if you want one for recycling. Rich says you have, we have one, right? Do we have a dumpster just for recycling of these materials? No, not for yeah. exactly. Oh, nothing at that size. I'll, I'll, I'll put something in the mail as soon as we talk to waste management about that. Rich, is, is the plastic pipe recyclable? I'm not even sure. Or does it go to the landfill? We take it to the landfill. I would think it's recyclable. I would imagine. I'm not sure of that. It won't get an answer. Rich, have you talked to all your guys about this? Make sure yes. that doesn't happen again. Yes, they are aware of it. Um, I sent my guys down there last week and, and guys were crawling over the hill. Um, and they pulled as much up as they could. And whatever um, whatever we couldn't do, if we go ahead with our plan, you know, we'll be able to get whatever else we can get that we see down there. Have you found another place to dump besides there? Um, no, I haven't found another place, but... Um, don't you think we should? I don't think. I mean, why would we when we have a place that close to the Public Works building? Well, we were taking down the road department before and dumping all the fuel down there. And why that stop? We ran out of space. And um, this was brought to the attention some time ago, um, 
you know, I've always been bringing it to the attention of the manager. Um, we always knew that we had hill talk. We knew what was involved in getting the public works building or property, you know, the, the permitting process and what was involved. It's going to be a considerable amount of money. Um, we always knew we had hill talk as our backup, which is in close proximity for efficiency reasons. I mean, uh, when a truck comes to unload, they load back up with stone or you know pipe or whatever material to go back to the job site. Um, so that's why it's ideal to be able to dump it the public works facility. Um, now that we can't do that, we have Hilltop, which is a mile away. Can we check with any contractor to see if anybody's interested in any fill? Um, not to my knowledge of, do I know if anybody's interested in fill. We have people that feel like when working in certain neighborhoods, people feel slip side that they, they're interested in the material, the fuel for, you know, their yard or whatever they might have for, um, if we're right there, we'll give it to them. Um, you know, it's it's time consuming. You know, we pull these, these uh, slip side, it's a um, whole harmless agreement that we're entering on private property to dump material. Uh, you know, we have to, um, ask people hey can we move your car uh where do you want it and, you know we always find it's difficult and they're not happy because you know they wanted it further back and nobody's home and you know it's just one thing after another it's, it has to come it's not even worth it the time we save because we're working right there we figure we can save some time that a lot of times we don't in the long run more of a hassle than what it's worth we, we've had some concerns with mixing what we're doing with what others are dumping, if there's a problem and like whatnot. I don't know that for certain that's a problem, but we've had some concerns. We like to have our own spot that we can manage and we can do that at Hilltop. Public Works would be ideal, unfortunately. What's involved is going to be piping part of a small tributary and it's going to be involved and it's going to take a while, take some money, but that's our plan. But uh, since we ran out of space there, this was always the plan to go back there. We never, this was not, this is not new. This is what we tend to do. So, it, I mean, it's going to be up to you if it's, and, 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 for, and to some extent, like you mentioned the road mill, the road mill, the millings are just to keep from rotting the ground and creating a problem. But if this is unacceptable to you through the community concern, I mean, like I said, we're going to honor your majority's opinion and move on and just want you to know what our position is and why and the implications to public works. Like we can't have guys standing around waiting for 20 minutes waiting for a truck to show up because it had to go up to who knows where and then go down to public works. Like those inefficiencies. I mean, we're going to be talking tonight about some things. We're working to try to make the organization as efficient and modern as we can. I think we're on the verge of some interesting things. But we don't want to have inefficiencies. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter for you to decide. This is just too unacceptable that you don't want us to do it. And so I, I think we can manage this a little better, make this work, but that's going to be your decision. I, I do want to ask one more question. Though. The optimal place to dump for you to save time is public works, correct? That's correct. Okay. The road program is over, correct? Yes. So we have until March or April till you start the next road program, probably. So in that time period, can't we find somewhere at PW? No. So no. not enough time? It's the it's it's the it's the permitting that we're concerned with. It, it would have been more ideal if this started a year or two back. I don't know. I think it was just a money problem. And we always felt like we were going to go back to Hilltop. I think that was always the plan. So um, if we, you know, we, we're going to spend some money at Hilltop cutting the queue. It's not going to be a whole of it. It's going to be some money. There's some engineering. So, I mean, if we do that, we want to fill out that area that I mentioned, about 20 feet on the bottom, still being designed a little bit, about 10 feet out from what it is now. But if we're not going to, we don't want to spend that money if that's, we're not going to dump there, but for, you know, but for another month or two. Uh, Mike, since that's near a Christian, we have erosion control fencing around here. Yeah, well, that's that's ordered. That material's ordered. We can do so much earth moving until we I have to move to the... It's not going to be a problem. We're not going to be that close to the creek. Okay. 
I said, it's been it's going to run so far. It's not that far because it's got some steepness to it, and we'll be able to fill there for a year or two if we do that before we. And that gives us time to get the public works facility ready and permitted. We just we see some obstacles there. I think that's why it didn't. I never asked John. I actually thought we were designing it and it was almost ready to go. To be honest with you, so this was a little bit of a surprise to me personally, but. I just suspect it was a cost and some engineering, and we had an option that we were we were waiting on. Um, okay, does anybody know how long we've been filling there at Hilltop, and how much of a distance we have filled of that void that was originally there? Well, I can tell you, um, when I started here 22 years ago, that was the place where we dumped for many years until we bought the purchased property of Public Works. Okay, so we've been putting fuel in there for 22 years. And I haven't been well, here lately. How deep does that go now? Oh gosh, um, there's a fence down there that we installed probably about 12 years ago to keep outsiders from dumping there. Right, I remember that. You know, it's hard to say, but we've, we've increased the area quite a bit down there over the years. I mean, we stopped for probably a 12, 10 to 12 year period for whenever we purchased the ground down in Public Works. And the main reason to do that also, is not only is efficiency reasons um, for our operation, but also to gain yard space down there, which was much needed for stockpile materials. Okay, and I agree, we'd never be able to build anything there without some type of pylons and stuff like that. Uh, I, when I used to coach PAL, we'd go down there for ball games and parking was very limited, even though it's a walk to park for that area, but it's used a lot by outside people. Uh, I know our officers go down there quite a bit for vehicles down there after hours at the park. So there are people to drive into that park area uh, I know when we were coaching ball and that down there, it would be good to have additional parking. Could that area be used for parking in the future? Absolutely. That's um, with the plan we're presenting to you this evening, um, doing the key and the necessary drainage. That's going to, you know, stabilization for that hill for whatever, you know, is proposed for the future, whether it be parking or et cetera. Okay, because I know even our, at our campus court down in Pence Woods, it's a walk to park too in front of Pence Woods Civic Association, but we have a little parking area because we know kids have friends that drive to play basketball or play baseball or whatever, so we provide parking there, uh, much unlike the area we were talking about up in Markview a month or so ago, not having any parking in that, so that would uh, help for some parking. Okay, that's all I have mentioned Markview, that's also a possibility. I mean, it's a little bit further for us to travel, but it's property that's owned by the township. Yeah, I just don't know how you would get in there. Well. <laughs> Unless you take helicopters and dump it. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I appreciate the people coming. I appreciate what they're saying, too. But the other thing from a safety standpoint, I don't think our trucks should be traveling through a residential area to dump. You know, I mean, that's up to Rich Albert. He's a road department director to find a place. If we have a field down there, then we need to put a sign out or, you know, free field, you know, take it your own risk. And Mr. Albert, did you say that you were dumping millions over the hill now? Up there? Yes. No. On the road? They're up there to keep, uh, you know, the soft area and dragging mud out onto the road. So that's just basically waste. Majestic. Thank you. Other commissioner? Well, well, I, <laughs> the plan was to do this project, and I guess we're moving along with that plan still. I know it's not popular and maybe not ideal with some, but this is what always the plan was. And uh, like I said, we look, re looked at our practices, and uh, I think we can do a little better. And I think we'll, if we're moving ahead with this, we'll be careful, make sure this is great and acceptable. And, uh, okay. can, I, can I ask a few questions of the group? I know as soon as they put it over right now, sir. I'm sorry. Mike, 
I do want to ask you a question before we move on. Um, is the cleanup going to take place first? Or it's just a, it's just a matter of getting the equipment there. So when we when we're down there cut the key, they were going to clean it, clean the rest of it. So there's some big equipment down there from the old days. It, 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 we could be further ahead and better off if we move ahead with this in some ways because it will be cleaned up and graded up eventually. Okay, thank you. Our next item is the work session discussion topics. Mr. Turley. Uh, as I wanted to take a minute to. Um, Mention you're, you're aware of this. Some of the work we did last year put us on a track to really take a look at the organization and what we were doing and use of technologies and various things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you know, I'm, I'm happy to say, and I want to commend the staff on a number of these. These things are going to be coming before you, some tonight, some next week, and some in September. And. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes that you don't always see over a period of months, but these have not been small projects. Um, they've taken some real effort to analyze, to bring recommendations back to you. So I just want to point out that I've been happy with the staff. These are things on top of your normal business demands, and some of them ended up being, I felt like, quite, quite demanding and time-consuming to help bring the right results to you I hope we're doing that but anyway the first one is the new website which we we, lo we lo launched last week we've worked on this since the study was done last year we were looking for a little better website a new platform and uh, we spent a great deal of time looking at who the provider would be which is Civic Plus we looked at all their modules and capabilities we entered into agreement negotiated with them and earlier this year we started working on the design of it, a whole, a whole new design, not only the layout and pictures, but the content management and working with the modules and so on. It's taken us quite a bit of time and effort to get here. And what I wanted to do, we've been very fortunate, you know, we're short staff too, and we sat down in the spring when things changed and we, we agreed that we were determined that we could bring these results to you and keep this on track and do our biz, normal business. And to be frank, it hasn't really been easy at times, but I've been, the staff has done a really, really good job. And uh, we've been very lucky. Sometimes you, um, you know, sometimes you get a good employee, um, sometimes you get an exceptional one. We've had some good interns here, but I want to introduce Jonathan Beskid. Uh, Jonathan's been an intern with us working on the website. And, uh, you know, as he said, he really punches above his weight, as they say. He's really, really got a bright future. He's very capable, and he's really, really helped us. And um, he's really operated like a professional in the office. So uh, I asked him to come out and just to, the idea here is just to um, let you see the website, give you an introduction. There's a couple of things Jonas is going to go through relatively quickly. You'll get to peruse the website. Uh, there's some things we may talk about today or very near future, how, you, how what, what John's vision was for some of this when we selected it, uh, everything with paperless meeting agendas so some other things. There's some decisions that will be coming before you. Uh, but today the purpose really is to introduce it and let you see a couple of features. So we'll probably spend 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to roll right into another analysis that we've been working on for uh, about seven or eight months. So with that, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and give them a little introduction to what uh, what our new website is all about. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so like you said, we've been working over this over uh, the past couple months here and working to get this online. So I'm just going to walk you through some stuff pretty briefly here, and then we'll take a look at what the site looks like and how, uh, uh, how this is a really great update that we've that we've been able to do here. So uh, just cover some basic terminology first. Um, these are terms that just come up over and over again. Some of them you may be familiar with, others not so much. Um, but a backend user essentially uh, refers to anybody that's uh, on the administrative staff that's making changes to the website. So um, that'd be myself, Mike, um, Juliana as well. Uh, we all make those changes to the content that's on there. The front end users is the public, so anybody that's accessing it from that side. And then the modules is just how we facilitate that information and how we present it to them. Um, there are various gadgets and gizmos that we can use in our website to do that. So, 
Um, the first thing that you do when you get on there, I just want to walk through this process pretty briefly. Um, there is an option to make an account, and um, it allows you to customize the website to you, uh, in a small degree, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But essentially, um, you just need an email address and to create a password, and then you get a sign in doing that, and you'll be able to set up some preferences, some profile information, notifications, things like that. Um, and those uh, front end capabilities, um, it's going to be they're called community voice and community connection. So community voice gives citizens the options to recommend ideas to the township, and community connection essentially acts as an online forum uh, that we can. Uh, they can create groups and interact with each other on. So it's sort of like a mini social media platform that's on our website. Um, and so to highlight just a few things, because our website does have a lot on it, but we're going to sort of showcase some of these. Uh, Notify Me and Alert Center. Um, this will essentially be taking the, replacing Nixle in the, sometime in the future. Um, and this is just so people can stay uh, notified of things, whether it's um, emergencies or whether it's just um, and they want to see updates to the calendar or something like that. Uh, the calendar module has options that we can now link things to, and um, we can put documents and attach even other web pages if we need to. So again, I'll show you this a little bit later. Uh, Newsflash uh, is a place where we can put press releases, uh, anything for new events, that kind of thing. A uh, business directory is just for businesses currently. It has um, various political organizations, uh, emergency contact information, but we are working on putting a lot of businesses. I've been working personally on that. Uh, currently, there's a little over 200, uh, and we'll be working to put those and get this available to the public as soon as possible. Uh, Civic Media is going to be our new live streaming option. Uh, so I know that we're doing that currently, but this will allow us to do it in. Um, pretty great high definition quality, and we are working out some equipment to, to purchase for that, to get it going, but um, I've worked with it a little bit, and it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, the Agenda Center is an option that we have for us to go paperless um, with our agenda system here. Um, there will be, uh, this is another thing where uh, we'll have to make a decision whether or not we want to purchase devices or uh, something of the like, or if you want to use personal devices, that kind of thing. But really, this is great because it allows anybody who's in the room to have access to an agenda if, if they want to during these meetings. So, um, and this goes across all commissions, planning commission, all of that. Uh, form center and facilities, uh, we have the options to do online forms and reservations. Um, currently, we just finished everything getting set up with uh, Elevon, so the e-payment thing we'll be working with going forward. But um, citizens can now do it from their from their homes. They don't have to come into the uh, to the building anymore to, to do some of this stuff. Some of the forms are still a little complicated, but we're working it out as we move forward here. And then the last thing I want to highlight here is uh, Pewik, and Pewik is our site analytics tool. And I'll show you. It has some pretty cool um, information that we can see how to tailor our website to our uh, to our constituents a little bit better. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to get into the website here. set to refresh on the uh, on page so um, there's actually another one here this thing this one's Braddock's Corral so it's something neat we're gonna be adding more pictures as we go forward but it's just something neat to keep the little bit of diversity in sight so we're not looking at the same pictures all the time um, right here is the um, this is the new slash widget that I talked about and this scrolls through so you can see um, just a couple different things that we have on there currently we'll be working to do some more of that. Um, this is just a welcoming statement uh, to our new website. So um, what I talked about is that when you create an account, it'll immediately bring up these preferences uh, for notifications. And so there are a couple of different things here. Um, you can either subscribe by via email or by mobile device. And all you have to do is just put it in there. I'm just going to sign in real quick here. Okay. I'm just going to sign in real quick here just so you can get a feel for, for how it works. So, um, under emergency management, if I wanted to get those notifications, I'd simply click 
the little envelope there, and that has it set up. That'll send a confirmation email once you confirm it in your own email account. Uh, you'll get all the notifications that are set up for there. Um, if you want to do mobile, there's this little box that says, I would like to be able to receive text messages on my mobile phone. Just click that, and then you click, you click the, the phone, and you put in your number and all that. So it's really great. Um, and you can subscribe to as many things as you want. There's calendar stuff, and generous agenda center stuff. Um, it's just a really great tool. And if you ever change your mind, you can just go back in there, uncheck the boxes, no harm, no foul. So um, go, go back to the home page here. And then I'm going to show you the Agenda Center because it's something that we're really excited about going forward. So, um, so if you look here, we'll have, um, these are all categorized. So we have regular meetings and the special meetings here. And so you can just uh, click on an agenda and it'll bring it up for today. Um, we're working on actually having like a, a template set up for the future, uh, but for this meeting currently, it's just a, a PDF file. Um, so if anybody today wanted to access this, they could go to our website and it, it would be there. And then if you wanted the minutes, you just check the check this little box here, it says minutes, and that brings up the minutes. So Jonathan, excuse me, if I could add, when, when, <clears throat> when this is fully operational in the near future, you'll just be able to go on and get files and information right if you, in your device in front of you. And you'll have a confidential center too for con that others can't get to for your for the confidential items. But it won't be quite like this in that the documents and files will be in, collect, attached electronically for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like you said, you can, we have options. We can link to extra pages. We can link to uh, different various documents, whatever you need. So um, it really is a great tool. And I know Juliana and I have been working with it um, a lot and particularly in training. So um, it's just something that's really great. The form center, I'm actually going to have to go through here and show you. Um, again, this isn't online just yet. We have just some things to work out real quick. But the um, I'm going to show you what our parks pavilions uh, reservation form is going to look like. It's pretty simple. Um, they have this all set out for us, so all you have to do is fill in all the information, click the boxes, and there will be an e-payment option with this going forward. Um, we do have some integrating stuff that we have to do, but um, yeah, this is what it will look like when they uh, when we're ready to, to release this. So um, then the other thing I want to show you here, I think this is the last thing before we get into PWIC, is the event calendar. And as you can see, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on here. We have parks and recreation meeting, board commissioner special meetings. Um, you have this option up here where it says select the calendar. Um, you can actually filter what you want to see. If you want to see everything, you can check all the boxes. Just want to see a couple, um, then you can just uh, you can filter them out. Pretty pretty neat way to, to sift through things here. Um, but for this one. It, click on the special meeting and then there's an option here that says more details. You click on that. And then you see here we have attached the, the meeting agenda to it. So I uh, just click right from there and pretty much we want to be able for people to get to all the information from one spot without having to go back to the home page. So, um, so we've, been, we've been working a lot about on this and it, it's Worked out pretty pretty well for us. Uh, like um, Mike said, this isn't the this isn't the end. Also, maybe somewhere down the road we we may change things. But it's a pretty great setup currently for where we're at, and um, we are also able to make improvements. There's a lot of remaining potential uh, for this website. But I'm going to show you here the the, the site tool, the PWIC, because this gives us some really cool information. So. Wait for everything to load here. Okay, so um, as you can see, this shows us the number of visits. Our launch was on uh, Monday the 31st, and as you can see, we'll skyrocketed up in, to 90 visits. Um, so this will show uh, the number of visits we've had on our website over the course of about a month. Um, here is the average visit duration, um, and down here, it tells us what the average is. So about four minutes on the website, that's pretty good. That means people are being able to find what they want and download it, and they're done with the site, and they close it out. Um, we can see that our heavy traffic hours are during normal operation hours between eight and four o'clock seems to be where 
where most of our, our data is collected here. And then we can also see um, how many people are using mobile devices, computers, um, what operating system they're using, and we may even have a thing for some, some of the locations. So we can see that most of these are happy in, in the United States, which would make sense. But um, it's, a, it's a really great stuff, um, and we're working on using this information as best we can to uh, really facilitate great communications between us and our community. And so we think you'll enjoy it. Um, if you guys have uh, any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. Um, and if we need to schedule something where I can show you some more stuff, that'll be fine. You can contact me through email or you can contact Mike and he'll get in touch with me. So, thank you. I do want to ask, uh, the e-payment program, yes. is that very costly? Is that really can be well, costly? It, no, it's not going to be costly, but we, we've been discussing this with uh, our next presenters <coughs> and Jonathan. And uh, I think we're going to bring back a, resol uh, a fee resolution to you, like a convenience fee. But right now, we haven't really had any transactions yet, and they're not going to be heavy right off the bat, so I wasn't totally worried about it. There is a fee, obviously, but um, there's a few other minor items that we're working on, and um, I, I thought we'd have them solved today, but uh, it, it's almost ready to go. But. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the fee will be, you know, I, I, there was a thought of just not even collecting a fee, but I feel like this is a, this is our effort to take some of our business out to the community and make it better for them, and they don't always have to come here on our terms, and there's a convenience to them, and I felt as though if it's a $5 charge, we should assess it, assess that fee, but I think we're going to bring that back to you in the near future and let you decide what you want to do. <clears throat> I did also want to ask, uh, did I hear you say correctly that you are going to have, the commissioners will have a little post office like area in there for comments and... Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, the citizens input stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I can show you that. Um, so if we go... I think what he's saying is you, you could set up a work group for the commissioners themselves to, to work in under the... Uh, yes. I think that's what you mean. Yeah. You're going to have a private area for confidential yeah. information. Yeah. And you could set up a commissioner's group, too, yeah. uh, or if, you, if you were interested in that. Yeah. <clears throat> to, to, I assume that's you know, to facilitate some communication. Right. right. So, no, I think we could do that. Yeah, so there will be that option to do things internally. Um, but if you wanted to see kind of, um, this is what we're, the things I was talking about that the public will be able to have access to. Um, this is the community connection, so this is the forum where they can create groups, they can make posts, um, that kind of thing. So, um, but the other one is the, the find it here, the, the community voice. And this one's this one's really neat. <clears throat> I thought this was a great um, application that they that they added to it. So. Um, there are different things you see community activity ideas, economic development, and all they have to do is click on it, submit an idea, they'll be able to see that. So it, it's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, like Mike said, we'll, we'll have a, a separate session for you guys to be able to communicate however you'd like. Um, we can do that. It's pretty pretty simple to set up. So. Okay. We'll have to discuss. So I think it might come up in our next presentation. We're going to merge some of these two. These were done together for a reason. But we're going to get into some other interesting things for you to think about. But we're going to you're going to we're going to, have to think about some devices and how you want to handle some of this. We we'll have some recommendations, but uh, we'll have a few decisions to make on if we're going totally paperless and how we're going to how we're, how we're going to do that. What what devices we need to buy and so forth. Uh, I got a quick question under the parks reservation thing. Is there going to be any kind of a calendar available there that whenever you go to reserve a park, you fill in your information, it's going to tell you if that park's available? Yes. So that's the reason that we haven't been able to launch it just yet. Uh, we have to input all of the current reservations into our system before uh, we can do that. But yeah, I'll show that to you just real quickly here, what that looks like on our website. So if we go to the facilities page, and we go to... Uh, Indian Lake. Uh, here we can see a calendar that says availability. So this will let you know after somebody's made a reservation, there'll be a little time slot that appears there. You'll be able to see that the park's been taken for the day or something like that. Okay. 
Jonathan, thank you. Wonderful job, as always. With nice job. Thank you. The expectations keep raising, and uh, he's really meeting them. It's really something to see. So I wanted him to do the presentation because I was sure he was capable of doing an excellent job, which he did. <laughs> so. so the next item is, uh, again, I want to make a point to discuss some of the efforts that have been made by the staff. This one is very, and there's going to be some real things for you to think about. I think what I would suggest you do is think about what you want the organization to look like and operate like a year or two or three years down the road. Because these are, these are seeds that you're planting that will impact uh, how we function and what we, how we, how, what we do. Uh, but I did want to, you know, this, I wish there was a, uh, I wish there was just a simple piece of software we could buy and all of a sudden we're, we're, we're high tech and everything's wonderful, but it isn't how it works at all. And it's taken a lot of analysis and all the departments really worked well. Parks and public works certainly, administration has been helpful. But this was one that the planning, com or the planning department had to really apply themselves. I feel like uh, some of it gears a lot towards them and Andy and Ryan really have given a lot of time and expertise to help us get to this. I think what we're trying to do is we're going to have uh, John Tran, who's here, you remember, and Adam is, is the technology uh, expert that's helped us with this. And what we wanted to do, this also came out of strategic planning, and our goal is to present to you where this took us. And this is a review of the township's use of technology and things we could do that maybe some other advanced communities and governments are doing to make us operate better. There's a cost with some of this. We did a rather extensive analysis. And our role, I think, is to present to you the options. I think our, our work doesn't end here, but it uh, closes this part of it, that we've come, we have a recommendation or two and we're presenting that to you and you'll have to make a decision. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce John, and you remember it from the strategic planning we did last year. This again is a odd growth of that. So, John. Thanks, Mike. Uh, as, as Mike said, I'm John Tram with Strategic Solutions, and also got Adam Osterreiter here with me. Uh, when I was here last time, we were reviewing the final recommendations from the strategic plan, and the commissioners adopted that plan. It was at the time I told you it was pretty impressive that you were investing in and prioritizing doing a strategic plan. It's even more impressive how far your staff has gotten you to this point in terms of implementation because on the heels of, of the commissioners adopting that plan, they rolled right into actually moving forward with implementation and bringing recommendations to you to take action towards implementing those strategies that you set as priorities. So tonight we have a boatload of information for you. We did give you a, a handout there that's a copy of the PowerPoint. You can flip through, just don't go to the last couple of pages because that's where the prices are. And like, you know, any good, uh, I'm not selling you anything, but like any good sales process, you can look at all the bells and whistles. Let me show you the uh, cruise control and the moon roof and all that stuff and then you can decide. But that really is what we're teeing up tonight. It's like Mike said, some really big picture policy decisions for the board to consider. Uh, and, and this is really important. It, it really helps to implement some of the priorities from the strategic plan. And that's where we're gonna start. I'm, I just wanna briefly highlight for you to remind you of the, some of the priorities that were identified. And to be honest, if I look back at that process, I think one of the recurring themes was technology regardless of the topic, and if you recall, we went through and organized everything by department, and almost every department had technology as a priority. And during our discussions with, during your meetings to review the recommendations, you all asked some really good questions about technology and options for upgrading the township's capabilities. So some of the things related to technology that were in a strategic plan were the work order system, customer interfaces, general technology uh, systems upgrades, mobile accessibility, and looking on the next page, our work order system came up again in Public Works, that first page was administration. Uh, the mobile technology also with respect to access to the mapping in the field, we're gonna talk a lot about your GIS. And I think I said last time when we met, you've got a lot of really good things going, a lot of really good infrastructure, and you're really well positioned to take things to the next level. This process, because as you know, we work closely with staff through the whole process, it's really targeted at North Huntington Township. And a lot of communities would not be well positioned to do what we're talking about tonight. So, and we wouldn't recommend that they do that. 
you fortunately have the staff and the infrastructure in place to, to consider taking things to the next level. So mobile technology in the field, general technology upgrades, and digitizing your meetings, recycling was talked about earlier. I think one of the biggest uses of paper has to be preparation for elected official meetings. I've seen lots of trees uh, mowed down for papers that uh, are produced for agendas for meetings. So uh, that is one way to help uh, recycle and cut down on use. So we're gonna start off with on the heels of the adoption of the strategic plan, we're rolled right into looking at what technologies you have now. I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Sorry, I wasn't advancing my own PowerPoint. Turn it over to Adam to talk about the review process that we went through uh, to look at the technologies you have now and recommendations for the future. Thanks, John. So this process really started back in March. Uh, we conducted meetings with all the department heads and Mike where we basically we just talked about technology and all the different needs uh, that were out there based off of the strategic plan. From that, we developed a list of 24 opportunities for improvement and recommendations on how to address those items. Uh, so we came back to, to Mike, I believe, in April with that list and again met with staff to prioritize that list and really uh, decide which ones we would focus on moving forward. And we, there was about a dozen items uh, that we determined were things that we should be looking at you know, this year and in the, the near future, and then there's some longer term items on that list as well. <coughs> um, so what you'll see here on this slide is basically just a, a snapshot of the work that was done uh, from all the discussions that was had with staff, uh, documenting, you know, some, where some of the challenges were, uh, whether that would be with silos of data or, you know, access to data, age of equipment, and then just, you know, having the necessary uh, technology and computing available. Uh, so this, this was just a snapshot of the 24 items that we came up with and, and prioritized. Adam can read each of the 24 items to you if you'd like. <laughs> One of the things we want to talk about is, is throughout this process I kept talking about buckets, so I feel like I had to put a bucket slide on. You guys have some great infrastructure now. One of the challenges and opportunities is that it's in different buckets, and those buckets don't really talk to each other. So, like I said, a lot of communities don't even have these buckets of information. A strong GIS system, a good permitting process. You guys have those buckets and they're well, they operate well. One of the opportunities is to get those buckets of information to talk to each other and be better accessible to staff, to residents, and to elected officials to be much more efficient, save money, share information more easily. So, an integrated system that pulls on all those buckets and brings them together is, is really one of the overarching recommendations and the, one of the highest priority recommendations that we saw. And also during the process, we talked about workflows. This is an example of a workflow that we put together because efficiency arises from creating a seamless transition from one step in the process to the, to the other. Your staff, uh, as evidence through this process, because everybody was engaged the entire process, works well together. Each of them had, each department had its own processes and sometimes the mechanics of their process doesn't work with the mechanics of another uh, department's process. That's common, it happens everywhere. So this is an opportunity to overlay a system to help facilitate that a little bit better so that, that workflow is more seamless to go from a citizen request all the way through a work order system, getting the work order completed and ultimately ending with an email back to the citizen uh, that would result in letting them know what happened with that request. You do have that uh, with uh, your system now to some extent, but the interaction with the resident related to the request isn't related to your workflow system, which isn't related to your GIS system, and so that's where the buckets, the separate buckets come in, which creates some inefficiencies with staff added, having to reproduce information multiple times, or result in having to, the creation of information that may already exist in another bucket, you can't get to it. So that workflow diagram can help us to really emphasize that we want to streamline that process and to make it more efficient. And so this slide here is, is just an example of the type of assets that you already have in your GIS system. Uh, the township has made a great investment in GIS. I think it's a very powerful tool. Uh, as you can see, you know, the, the different kind of uh, points, lines, and polygons that are out there, you know, there, there's thousands and thousands of these in the GIS system today. Uh, so this is an important point to note because we want to build on the existing system and make sure that this data is accessible to all the departments anytime that they need it and any of the work that's being done is tracked back to GIS. 
you know, GIS is really the driver behind uh, what's happening with operations and what happens with the technology. Before you leave here, this is a really specific example of something that you already have solid to build on. A lot of communities don't even have a GIS, or they think they do, and they've got really cursory information. You've got a lot of good information here to build on. So with that being said, uh, we went out to do a software evaluation. And where we started with that was first identifying what the requirements were going to be in order to conduct that evaluation. Uh, so you'll see here, really the focus was on the key areas that John has pointed out, the, the GIS and making sure that it would enhance the existing functionality and work with the data that's already in place. Finding a work order system, uh, both accessible to the public, but then internally uh, for tracking work, for tracking assets, tracking costs. A permitting solution, to work with what Andy and Ryan are already have in place for permitting, planning, and zoning, and being able to take all their existing data and transfer that over uh, and connect it to the GIS system as well. Same with code enforcement, uh, a citizen portal, so that citizens can go to the website and log a service request if they need something done, say a stop sign's down, there's a pothole, uh, they have a concern, they'd be able to log it on the website and have that flow directly into the software so that the staff can get that, perform the work, and then in that workflow diagram that we saw a couple of slides back, it would complete the process of the data coming from the citizen, going to staff, completing the work, updating the GIS, and then going back to the citizen to let them know what's being done. And of course, we had to look at cost to find something that you know was cost effective, would give you the biggest bang for your buck. So in that process, we went out and we looked at over a dozen software packages. Um, these software packages are geared toward local government, municipalities, and they range in size uh, from you know, very small companies that have a narrow focus to very large companies that serve you know, very large cities, the Bostons, Chicago's, New York cities. Um, so with that, you know, I, I went through and uh, we uh, made contact with these companies, uh, researched them, looked at the functionality, and tried to whittle that down to a more reasonable list to work with. Uh, what we found is you know, out of the 13 that are up there, and then there were other ones that uh, we looked at them not as closely, but of the 13 that we really looked at closely, uh, some of them didn't have all the functionality, all the requirements that you know that we wanted. Uh, so we were able to toss them out of the process early on. Uh, we narrowed it down to about six software packages that met all the requirements, and then from there we did some further analysis on the cost, and we were able to then remove a couple of the other uh, software packages simply based off of the, uh, the the cost, where they're geared toward much larger municipalities. Uh, that wouldn't make sense uh, here for the township. So from that, we narrowed it down to three in particular that we took a, an in-depth look at. Uh, we did software demos, we worked with Andy, I uh, worked with uh, Ryan Fonzi, and some other staff to look at the software, determine the, you know, if the functionality fit, allowed staff to ask questions, and, you know, had some interaction back and forth, and then we created a separate matrix, which you'll see kind of in the background here on the slide. Uh, it's a very long spreadsheet we went through with specific questions, things that had come up from the staff meetings where we said these are requirements or these are things that we would like to have, certain functionality that we're looking for, and then we rated each software package on, that, on those uh, particular points. Uh, so you'll see that the three packages that we looked at, uh, the first one's called Tracer, uh, the second one's called Elements XS, and then the third one is a existing package that the planning department is already using called GeoPlan. Since uh, it was already here, it made sense to look at that to make sure you know, if, if it could offer the functionality that we we're looking for or, or not. So through that process, through all the scoring, uh, you'll see up here on the scores that this software application by McMahon Associates called Tracer came out uh, to be the best performing of the bunch as far as meeting all the requirements, uh, being the most cost, cost effective, and providing all the functionality that we were looking for. So at this point, we've identified uh, Tracer you know, as probably the best solution of all the packages that we've looked at. Um, it, it has the GIS functionality, and uh, it's also a Microsoft partner. One of the most important things, too, about what your staff is bringing to you is that it is a, a third-party evaluation. This can be very overwhelming. It's a, a really important decision that you would consider. It affects every department and every function this municipality and it, this isn't as though we are salespeople we're just to be clear we're not connected to any one of these software companies and your staff brought us in to work with them to say what would be the best fit for North Huntington so I, I want to make sure that you understand that we're, we're not selling Tracer although they, you know, they love us they love the fact that we're here obviously making this recommendation but, 
But we looked at, like Adam said, uh, a dozen of options, and this is the best option for you to consider. And really, one of the reasons why, I'm not the technical guy, obviously, so I just think of big bubbles, um, but that is the overlay thing. Tracer does the best job of overlaying over top of your processes and your buckets of data and allowing you and your residents and your staff to access, to access that information in a seamless way that's much more efficient and ultimately saves costs. So I envision it as Tracer being this center and all this information feeds up into it. Like Adam said, there's so many options. A lot of them, they would have one bucket but not the other. Or they do a good job over here with permitting but not a great job with, uh, with road tracking. Uh, so Tracer, it's not like the perfect system, but it is the best system out there we believe you have access to uh, and it's within a financially reasonable situation that can successfully do all the things that we identify work with your staff it needs to do. All right, so I'm going to jump into some of the benefits of the software. Feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, I'll try not to keep, you know, go too technical, uh, get a little excited uh, with this kind of stuff. Um, so first of all, the, the software, as far as uh, the IT benefits, uh, Tracer is a what's known as a software as a service, which means the company that developed Tracer, McMahon Associates, they host it for you. So there's no IT requirements as far as bringing in servers and infrastructure to get the software up and running and then support it. Uh, it's a subscription-based, and then you'll see the, the pricing later as we go. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of benefits to this. So not only do you not have to worry about maintaining the infrastructure and the software, uh, but you're also getting the updates and you know, any new features that would be coming, uh, you get them automatically released to you by subscribing to the software. And you can opt out of them if you want. Uh, Tracer ha has some functionality for that, so you can stage the updates, you can uh, plan them so the staff is ready for them. Uh, the other nice thing with it, because it's web-based, you can access it anytime from anywhere from any device. So you don't have to be in the office, you don't have to be on a VPN connection. It's accessible you know, anytime uh, in the world. That software as a service thing is important because we did look as another option about doing this in-house. Sometimes places will ask, and we legitimately ask that question here, could we do this in-house? And really the answer was you'd need like two and a half Ryans and another half of Andy and you know, the staffing level. And even if you were to say, well, we're going to staff up, five years, the technology changes so fast, it'll be so inefficient for you to do it, to do what you need to do. But we did look at that cursory as an option. So moving on, one of the other big benefits with this is the integration with the GIS system and the mapping. So there, there will be full integration with Tracer with the existing GIS system, which is an Esri-based system. Uh, what's in place today is an older version of Esri with a limited uh, database. And what this will do is take the township up to the, to the latest release from Esri, which is a cloud-based solution as well called RGIS Online. All that data can be uploaded to the cloud and synchronize. So as Ryan is making updates, he can push that up to the cloud and Tracer will reflect that real time as he's working. Uh, so what this does is it opens up GIS to all of the staff. Because right now it's limited to just to the folks that have the GIS software on their desktops. Where with this solution, uh, Ryan and, and the GIS folks will be pushing that data up to Tracer, which then is available 24-7 you know, via the web. It also opens the door to using some of the latest tools and applications from Esri. So aside from Tracer and the discussion we're having, it opens the, the door to uh, mobile apps specifically for GIS and some other tools that are out there that currently today staff cannot use because they're too far behind on uh, some of the software versions out there. And this is just a, an example. This is a screenshot straight out of the Tracer software. And what this is showing is the stormwater system uh, in another municipality. And so what it's showing is, first of all, the integration with GIS because it's bringing up their mapping layers, they're turning on the stormwater system, and it's also even showing uh, the path that the stormwater would travel. So it's just a good example of how GIS and Tracer really come together. Uh, so currently, a lot of this data is in the GIS system and not accessible to staff where they'd be able to go into Tracer and pull up any layer, any asset that they would like in GIS and be able to display that on the map. So, so Adam, this would be particularly useful from a device side of the field uh, for public works, uh, for example. Yeah, for all, for all staff, and we're gonna to touch on that in a few slides. Uh, so we're actually, we're actually, to your point, we're gonna to get to some of the department benefits, go to department by department. 
So one of the things that came out of our discussions with Parks and Rec is they needed a way to track work out in the park. Uh, right now, a lot of it is word of mouth, uh, paper, and they have some challenges with efficiency with that and making sure that the work is being done uh, and, and done on time. Uh, so a system like this with work order management and asset management would allow for Parks and Rec to have all their assets in the system. They could be uh, spatial assets where they're on a map, uh, GIS based, and then be able to create work orders against those assets or just general work orders to go do something in the park. And all that would be accessible to staff both here in the building as well as staff out in the field with, with mobile access. Uh, one of the other items that came up with Parks and Recreation is also the need to track code violations, uh, and in some cases high grass uh, cost tracking, where they have to go out to a property and cut the grass because uh, you know, no one's there or it's just not being maintained. And the software would give them the ability to create work orders to do that, to track the cost, and even put liens against the software and spit out reports and invo invoices to show the work that's being done and be able to report on you know, what does it cost the township every year uh, to go out and, and do these, main, uh, take care of the code violations. So for the planning department, one of the big keys here is that Tracer uh, and the folks from McMahon Associates have a lot of experience migrating the data from GeoPlan, which is the existing software package that's being used by the township today. Uh, they've done three clients and their migration from GeoPlan to Tracer to be able to move the permits, the planning, the zoning information uh, uh, to Tracer. Uh, they're actually working with North Fayette right now, very close to going live, and that's a GeoPlan to Tracer migration as well. So all that data, all that history can carry over to Tracer. Um, and obviously Tracer has the permitting code enforcement and zoning modules that are necessary uh, to do the operations for the planning department. And it also would provide mobile access to inspections in the field, uh, code violations in the field, and all the GIS data uh, that that's, the township has as well. And any drawings or photos or documentations that, that's out there in GeoPlan or that might be forthcoming or that's out on the network, all that can be put into Tracer as well and accessible from any, any device. So this is just an example of pulling up a parcel or an address uh, in Tracer. So it's linked to the GIS system. And really what it's showing, if you look in the top right corner, uh, it, the big takeaway from this is the fact that you can see all the information related to this parcel or to the address that you've searched for. So if there are photos attached, documents, permits, building plans, any work order history that might have been performed at that address, all of that's available uh, just by a quick search of an address or a parcel. So you get a, a complete overview of what the township has done at that property rather than having to go to multiple locations, talk to different people, maybe pull up paper or spreadsheets and, or the GeoPlan software. It's a one-stop shop for everything that you would need to know across the organization. Yeah, now I'm talking about accessing this information, one of the other things we really pushed on was how do you build the information into the system? Because a lot of times that's not always user-friendly. So, and everybody, obviously you don't have everything in your GIS, now you're building it. So this system really makes it pretty easy to be out in the field and for public works and any department to be out in the field and collect data and feed it into this system and then have it be accessed by anybody in the back end or the public. So another benefit of the Tracer software is the public facing website that would be available. And there's a bunch of different features that would be available to the public. Uh, first, if, if the commissioners and staff chose to, they could make a GIS website available to the public, much like a, that's used internally to look at different layers and assets and information. Uh, you can decide what types of information you want to make accessible, perhaps streets, addresses, uh, fire hydrants, anything that you think would be valuable to the public, and actually tie that into your website so that they can do go to, go to the site, uh, see the same things that staff are seeing, do searches, obviously you would have complete control over what you want to show external to the public versus what would be internal to staff. But it does give you that capability to put that out there on, on a GIS facing website. In addition to that, I, I've already mentioned that citizen portal where citizens could go put in service requests, whether that be a pothole or a sign down or a code violation, and that would flow into staff and then they could evaluate the, the validity of that request and decide how they want to take action on that and put their notes in the system. Uh, if there's any cost tracking, they could put that in there, photos, anything that they would need to complete that request and document it for the future. Another piece of that that will be coming in the 
future, uh, by the end of the year, will be the ability to enter building permits online for citizens. And the intent there would be to focus on kind of the low hanging fruit, uh, you know, decks and sheds, uh, the more basic permits where a citizen could go to the website and start that process, provide the necessary information to get that permit process kicked off. Uh, the more in-depth permits, the ones that have a lot of different fee calculations, uh, probably still want people coming in to, to the building to work with staff on those, but this would help automate some of the, the more basic permits as well if you were, choose to adopt it. Um, it also allow you the communication back to the citizen, whether that's for the service request or a permit process as to what's happening, what is needed, do they need to upload additional documentation, uh, site plans, whatever it might be, you're able to have that two-way communication with citizens. Uh, also, in addition, that we're not really diving into today, but there is the capability to track uh, snow plows with GPS devices and display that in the software, both internally for staff, and if you wanted to, you could also display some of that information externally to the public on the GIS uh, public-facing website if you wanted to show where trucks have been, what roads are clear, that kind of thing. Uh, that's not part of this project today, but it is something just so you're aware in the future that can be done if the commissioners would have interest in that. This is just a screenshot of the citizen portal. This one in particular is for the service request. Uh, this is where the citizen would come in if they have a, a, any kind of concern, any kind of issue, even if they just want to ask a question, they would enter this on the website. And it, it would be tied in with the new Civic Plus website that Jonathan mentioned earlier. Right now there's already a report of concern button on the website that goes to the old ego work order system. It would be simply switching that link to go over to Tracer. Uh, it would be seamless to anyone on the website. As Mike said earlier, we've been involved with helping staff do a lot of these different pieces. The, the resident requests, the website, this the software system that we're, we've been looking at. We, we really try to identify as many efficiencies as possible. We don't just want to keep re recommending different software systems. So we did a lot of head scratching, like how do we connect these dots in the most efficient way? And what we're recommending to you tonight, we believe, is the best way to bring it all together. It still involves some separate systems, but it makes it much more efficient and, and maintain uh, streamlined. So there's also some benefits to be seen for emergency management. So Jonathan touched on the notify me functionality on the website where the township can be pushing out notifications via email and text to residents. But in turn, Tracer can be used to receive information from the residents. Uh, an example of a disaster, say a flooding situation, residents could go on online and fill out that service request to let the township know if they need assistance, if there's been damage, uh, if, if uh, township staff needs to go out and do an evaluation or an assessment. And collecting that kind of information can be very valuable, especially when there's a disaster uh, that needs to be declared and filing that information with FEMA so that you have the correct reporting and the cost so that you can demonstrate you know, the fact that you need to declare an emergency. Uh, also with emergency management, uh, another benefit with this is making the GIS system and all of the data for work orders, permits, addresses, parcels, whatever you would choose, making all that available to emergency management personnel uh, anywhere that they might be. So whether that's in the office or in a vehicle, if they have computer access, they'd be able to pull up the GIS system. They'd be able to look at addresses, parcels. Uh, if you want to make it accessible to them, they could pull up uh, building plans. They could pull up permits, they could pull up work order history, you know, perhaps you have a citizen that's a frequent flyer, is constantly putting in work orders or complaints, you'd be able to kind of capture that uh, so that they know what they're dealing with when they go into a building or they go to uh, address the citizen. So there's a lot of opportunities there. That was one, something that came up in our discussion with the police department, is making sure that they have access to the GIS system, particularly the roads and the uh, address parcel information. So that would all be accessible to them with that internet connection. So Public Works would be potentially a very big user of, of Tracer and see a lot of benefits. First, you would have the GIS integration. So you would be able to, they would have access to all the assets that are out in the field. Uh, the list that we went over earlier, uh, they would be able to pull all those assets up in the field, whether that's catch basins, signs, traffic signals, whatever it might be, and then see all the supporting documentation that goes with that, as well as tracking their work against that. So if there is a certain asset that perhaps is causing problems, you know, the costs are running up, you'll be able to see that if you put in the necessary information every time you're doing work against that asset. Uh, 
In addition to that, they would also have mobile access so that they could take a device out of the field and use it to actually locate assets. So if they're looking for a manhole that perhaps is difficult to find, they can use the GPS technology in the device to get them close to the, to the manhole. And there's also additional GPS devices that can be paired Bluetooth with the, an iPad or a tablet or a smartphone that could get them down to centimeter accuracy to find manholes or whatever the asset might be. So th there's some different scenarios that we can work through as to what the right piece of technology is to take in the field. That's what I want to ask you. Um, it makes more sense to use an iPad and that type of application. If Rich needs to take pictures of a certain mm -hmm. area or something, it's, it's always easier to use a, a bigger device. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend a phone. I would say some kind of tablet device. And then you, you can even get a tablet that has a, uh, a keyboard case if you wanted to do a lot of data entry, although the keyboard on the screen is probably sufficient for you know limited entry out in the field. But yeah, you can utilize the camera, you can utilize the GPS functionality, and just the, you know, the quickness of being able to turn it on and get into the application and, and into the website. So it would need a cellular connection built into it so you can access the internet. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Just web browser. Uh, and also with that, you'll be able to collect data out of the field. So if Public Works is putting in a new sign or a catch basin and they want to capture that data, they can do that with the device. They can use the, the location functionality to pinpoint on a map exactly where they're putting that asset, uh, capture information, photos, documentation, drawings, notes, whatever it might be, capture that on the mobile device and then send that back to the GIS system where it can be reviewed for approval. Yeah, so it doesn't automatically go in, the staff can look at that and approve those changes and now they're actually updating the GIS system with new asset information or changes to assets. So it's an efficiency there where you're not always relying on Ryan or someone that knows the GIS system to go out in the field to capture the assets say after the fact or have to tag along with public works. They'd be able to capture the assets themselves and then use that data for work orders. Or, or think about some of the public works getting a map generated by planning, have that printed out, take it out in the field, mark it with a pencil, bring it back, and put it in the GIS. Now you've got all the GIS information available in the field. With a touch of a button, you're putting that information right in. So along with that, they can also track street paving. So they can track the, the quality of that, and, and there's a screenshot coming up on that. But it'll, you can track uh, the type of asphalt that's out there, road segments. If you go out and have somebody actually assess uh, the pavement, you can bring those scores and those ratings back into the system so that you can run reports to see you know, where the lower scores are and help you make some determinations on what you want to do with your paving program. Uh, you can also, as I mentioned, put GPS trackers on the snow piles if that's something you would desire and see where those trucks are in the system. And you can also, there's a, there's a separate piece to it that's not GIS based, but you can track physical assets that are not on a map, you know, vehicles and equipment and you can track work against that. So in the case of fleet, uh, you would be able to track when the oil needs to change based off of mileage. You can have the uh, registration automatically fire every year to create a work order for staff to remind them that they need to renew the registration on a vehicle uh, and any kind of maintenance. So you can do preventative maintenance that you build into the system that would fire automatically uh, on a piece of vehicle or on a vehicle or a piece of equipment or you can also have reactionary work orders where they know there's a problem, the vehicle's not running correctly, they know it's due for an oil change, and they go in and they create the work order to track that and then perform the work and close that out. And what's nice about that is you know, that's visible across all departments. So if they're working on a vehicle for Parks and Rec, uh, Parks and Rec staff would also be able to see what's being done on that and vice versa. If Parks and Rec is doing something with an asset or, or equipment out in the in the parks, Public Works might have to work on that at a later date and they would be able to see what's been done on that so it would be accessible to all staff. And talk about the street information too. You've been working with CMBO in that robotic system. We did talk to Tracer, they can migrate all that data into the GIS as well. And this is a, just an example of an asset in the system, in this case, traffic lights. So it, it's putting on here the, the traffic lights and the intersections on a map as well as allowing you to pull up all the information about a traffic signal uh, when you're out in the field. So photos, permits, HOP uh, permits, any kind of information you might need while you're out in the street, you know, working on an intersection, uh, that would be available. And then this is just a, another example of, of the paving that I mentioned where it's tracking the, the type of pavement and you can put the quality and the ratings in there as well. 
So let's quickly recap some of the efficiencies and then we'll get into the process of how to actually implement this. So this talk, this system would remove the data silos, connect those buckets I mentioned earlier. It would be a single source of data across the organization instead of different buckets of data living uh, in different departments. Uh, GIS, mobile access for all staff, accurate field data collection, detailed work order permits and tracking, and detailed history and on uh, assets and property. So you click on a park pavilion and you're going to know, know, you know, when's the last time you put your roof on it, does it need something fixed, there's a work order attached to it, etc. And that's the, the asset dashboard that lists everything by asset. So in terms of the costs and the initial investment, there is a startup, like to migrate all this stuff over. There is an initial investment there. That's the startup, startup cost number of 16.5. Then the annual cost is about 30,000 a year. We did talk with uh, with Tracer about, this is not just like an off the shelf number. Obviously it's not a contract number. You can do a contract for you to sign it. This one's for you to consider budgeting for, but it is based on your needs, the size of your community, and how they anticipate. Uh, the system working for you. So that's the, the, the cost for the software. And then we're also going to start dovetailing into the paperless agenda because we also looked at organization wide that IT system uh, analysis that we did. So that kind of brings everything together. And here's some of the hardware upgrades that you need to implement Tracer. And what we're talking about here is a mobile device, as the commissioner mentioned, an iPad would be great in the field, maybe a, uh, or a Samsung, you know, what, something else. Um, but then, and then also we have these mobile uh, Bluetooth GPSs because your, your iPhone's only so uh, so accurate. When you're located in a main hall, it's kind of important. You know, you want to be you can be 15 to 30 feet off if you're just using your phone or an iPad. So we pair up the mobile device with a Bluetooth GPS that so connects seamlessly. Recommending uh, two mobile devices for public works and one Bluetooth, a mobile device and a, a, a two mobile devices for parks and rec. Uh, they can borrow public works if they need to or planning. Uh, in planning, we see two mobile devices and a, and a GPS. And then administration, we see mobile device. So roughly, you're looking at seven mobile devices for 4,500 and two Bluetooth GPSs for about seven thousand. Um, on public works, I think the sign crew would uh, make good use of an iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have to retrieve their work orders from this location mm -hmm. uh, on Parks and Rec. Uh, there should be one in Oak Hollow and one in India Lake. Mm -hmm. We have two major facilities. Yeah. Um, for planning, uh, Andy, uh, you should probably have one for code enforcement and the building inspector, other than yourself and Ryan. Okay, we can update that list. We, we discussed the, the number of devices and some, like Ryan might be able to share with uh, Josh or one of the others, but as we go forward, if that plan doesn't work, we can always buy another device. Yeah. So it's, Josh use a lot of yeah, we're just trying to put some numbers. So, you know, I think the effort is, here's the cost, the total cost to what we need to do this uh, software and hardware wise. On the paperless meeting stuff that Jonathan talked about earlier, there's also obviously you need something to access that system. So for the commissioners, it'll be seven, it'll be about $5,500. And again, these are ballpark numbers. Uh, and then staff, they use the same ones that they use for tracers. So the directors that come to the meeting for just bring their, their tracer mobile device. And we also want to make sure we noted here to adopt the use policy because it's important uh, that the commissioners decide how those are to be used as devices for the commissioners. And, from an open record standpoint, it's usually not a good idea to mix and match the personal stuff with, with uh, township business. On uh, the hardware upgrades to the overall IT system, the administration server needs to be replaced next year. It's about 50,000. Uh, there are several PCs that, that, that need to be replaced within the next two years. That's a little over 40,000. And the police department needs to upgrade its server and PCs a couple of years out. Uh, in the $44,000 range. So your next steps for consideration are to consider budgeting for next year for Tracer, consider budgeting for the mobile device devices and the GPS devices, uh, consider the devices for yourselves for the paperless agendas, and then the server replacement that you know is coming next year or needed next year. As a time of information, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Well, I just want to add, 
it, it was a little lengthy, and I realized that, but we, it, it takes a lot of grasp on this, and I felt as though you had to see the benefit side, and we had to spend some time on that. You can see it was designed to, uh, what can we do now? What will we be able to do that we can't do now? How is it more efficient? Is it worth the cost? So I think you see the cost there. I, I know we were over something a little less than that, but then I saw what some of the other programs were, and it, it really goes up from there. But this was the one that really, the only thing that fit into our, what we were trying to do. I, I, you know, if, if, there's some options. I mean, we can put this in a budget. You can contemplate it a little bit. They can, you can ponder it. I don't think you should try to make a decision tonight. Maybe you know already whether you're for or against something like this, but they can come back. You can do your own research. Um, we can, you can slow walk it. Maybe it's something we do six months or a year down the road. But um, I, I would suggest maybe we put this in the budget if you seem to be in favor of it. And then at that time, we can discuss it some more. And then if you want, before we purchase it, we can even have some more discussion. That would be a, a way to I didn't want you to feel like you, you felt like you needed to make a decision tonight. This was really to present the study to you and what the recommendations were. So. Okay, Mike, if you want to go ahead and put that forward, just put it in the budget for next year, and then we can discuss it during that time. I'm okay with that, too. Yeah, I got a couple questions. Uh, the, uh, is this going to take place of any of our work with like Shiloh and that? Are we going to save money with going with this tracer? Well, we're going to, yeah, we're going to save some money in some of that. Well, there, we're hoping, hopefully there's some efficiencies and we'll save that way. But uh, direct savings, geo plan would be gone. So there's a savings there. And uh, help me, Adam. Yeah, there'll also be an opportunity. I think you have a GIS, a GPS device right now, like a standalone GPS device. There would be an opportunity to kind of trade that in and go for a cheaper tablet device. Uh, but as far as Shiloh, they provide your computer server services. They maintain the hardware, so they would continue to do that. And those numbers that you saw for the server and PC replacements, those came straight from Silo. We, we just worked with them on that. Yeah, we're trying to coordinate. We're doing so much long-range planning right now. We're trying to coordinate Shiloh's and the that's upgrade with with what we're what they're recommending. Right, so we do have some other uh, like the police department has a Cody system. This isn't going to replace any of that. Our administration, I think payroll and that still runs on DOS, I think, but uh, is that going to replace any of that? Yeah. No, that doesn't. Okay, and our new website that's coming up, you're saying about the citizens' complaint and getting back to the citizens. Is that going to work with our website? Yes, it'll be No conflicts or. Yeah. Okay. This, is, this is more robust. This is, this is way more robust. They'll work together, but this is a step up from like what we do now. Yeah, those other software packages are usually specific to a department. So like the Cody system, only the police are accessing it. This is something that kind of sits across the whole organization with data that everybody should be able to see and have access to. Like the roads, the GIS, yeah. and stuff. Okay. Yeah, right now, planning takes a snapshot of the GIS and gives it to the police to use. So it's not real time. So it's actually kind of, it's pretty long time now. This makes that all seem yeah, I know that you both great that, so. At the, at the outset, I mentioned to you, just in my feeling, um, you know, from your own opinion, obviously, but I think this is a question, it written, for me, it is such a policy question on what you, how you want the organization to operate down the road, and what, you know, the whole purpose of this was to point us into a higher technology, uh, more efficient operation, where we can, going back a year or two, and this is where this has brought us to, so, it's a question of what do you, is this worth the benefits and is this how you want us to operate? I'm sure we'll have some challenges in implementing, implementing it, but I'm, I feel, and they feel that we have the staff and we'll be able to do this, and this is going to really benefit us, our operations, our efficiencies, uh, so forth. I wanted to ask you guys uh, who else uses Tracer at this time? What other townships? There's over 30 municipalities that are currently using it, and then they have some contracts where they're adding. Uh, other municipalities as, as we speak. Uh, North Fayette is about to go live. Fox Chapel, Pine Township. And we could get you a more extensive list uh, off the top of my head. Those are the ones yeah. I have to recall. North Fayette, Fox Chapel, Pine. And then one more. Moon. Moon. For Western PA. And then they have 30 across the state. So it's, it, it's, it was interesting that some of them were smaller than us. And I think some of them that we, we've, we've had some conversation with North Fayette. They're really looking forward to implementing this. Uh, they're smaller than us, and that, that was sort of part of just, 
our my internal analysis, like who's using this and what are the benefits. So there, there, there are people that are favorable to this, and some are local, and some are smaller than us. Thank you. some things coming. Next week we're going to talk about some of the findings of the comp plan work that we've been doing. Uh, you know, some of it's been a little difficult to keep on track because we have so many of these extra large assignments as I mentioned. But I, I think there's some interesting things there. And we're also going to have, uh, I, I think we're going to try to have Ryan come in and do a little presentation on the robotics road piece that might wait till September. But all, all that's in the work. So uh, the goal was to bring all this together at the end of the year as we work in the budgeting so that we, you know, it's a logical process. Item three. I apologize for the length of that, but it was I felt like it was important enough and we needed to really delve into it. But item three is the issue that I mentioned to you on Timothy Road, and uh, we felt as though we needed to have a public discussion or okay to move ahead with it. And it's simply the matter that uh, we were looking to be in a cooperative venture with RWS Shivers uh, to widen and repay Timothy Lane. Our involvement would be with the widening. Our share is about twenty-four thousand of a total cost that looks like around seventy-eight thousand. So we just wanted any public discussion and okay to go ahead with that. Excuse me with that project. Okay. Item four is a matter with RWS development concerning sidewalks and. Uh, I see they're here, so uh, they can come up and present or request to you. Boss, you RWS Development, 8958 Hill Drive. I want to mention one thing about this Timothy Road up there. When we did that agreement with them to haul the fill up there, they told us, and they put it in writing in the contract with us, that they would repair that road or anything else that was wrong with it. Well, the township didn't get any bonds or anything off of them because they were basically told they didn't need one. So the only thing we go on is that contract that we have with them. But it doesn't, if they say they're not gonna fix it, I don't know, we're gonna be talking to them next week. Hopefully we can convince them. Now, Robbie has some ways of putting some pressure on them that might make them think a little bit about doing it. But basically, you have no contract with them, you have no bond with them. So that does worry me. <clears throat> I'm sure that Robbie lets you know what goes on on uh, Monday or Tuesday after the meeting. So, but he's fighting like hell to get us a road over there, just like you are. But I guess you were gonna wide it four feet? <clears throat> I'm here tonight to talk about sidewalks and asking for a waiver for some sidewalks, and I'll explain what I'm up against. Approximately two weeks ago, I was informed by uh, Tom McGuire that we could no longer get a home office permit for any buildings that we closed on a sidewalk community if the sidewalks weren't put in there. So what that means is that we can't put sidewalks in for five or six months out of the year, so I guess we can't close any houses for five or six months out of the year. If there was a way that this can be worked out, I'd probably think differently about this, but I've talked to three of the banks that do the majority of our uh, lending, and they want an auxiliary permit, not a temporary one, and then there was some discussion about bonds. These individuals aren't capable of getting a bond, Imagine yourself going out and trying to get a bond for ten to fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, they're fighting hard enough to get the money to build a house, let alone get a bond. So that does concern me.
right? On the Weber plan, when I took it in front of the Planning Commission, they approved it with no uh, sidewalks. But I talked to Annie, and he convinced me to put the sidewalks in, and I did. And I was fine with it until I found out that I can't get off street permits for these houses. So I don't know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to put sidewalks in there. And besides that, these are on cul-de-sac streets. One's about 700, one about eight or 900 feet long. They're both dead end streets. <clears throat> I believe one has 20 or 21 lots in it. The other one has 28 lots of, uh, these are probably gonna be older people, adult community basically as we've done up at Buena Vista. Those people are up there in the evenings. I go up and I visit and I talk with them. They're on the streets. They got the roads blocked because there is no traffic up there other than them. There's, what, 28 of them are gonna be living there, so they like to go out and BS to one another. And it is a community, probably more than any community I've ever uh, built. They actually go outside and enjoy themselves. Several weeks ago, North Hanging Township sued two of our residents in the township for no sidewalks. Do we want to sue our residents for craziness? I mean, I'm concerned. We're going to sue at the general public, North Hanging Township. Do you personally want to sue any of these people for that? I sure as heck don't. I was also informed that we're not going to only have four foot sidewalks, they're going to be changed to five foot sidewalks because the ADA says that we should do that. I have the website and everything on the ADA right here. The ADA does not apply to private property. It only applies to government funded properties or government like public housing or something like that. The other thing is the restraints of ADA are to the point where you can't even put sidewalks in Western Pennsylvania. They, I think they allow 8% slope and I've got 12% streets. Now I don't have 12% streets in either the plans I'm talking about, Weber or Brookhaven Ford. <clears throat> Oakton Manor sidewalks, I drove through there the other day and I would like some of you to go through and look at those walks. There's one area where it's dropped two feet or two inches. Stumbling block. You know what the typical sidewalks do after they've been in for a while? Now, these aren't owned by the township. Are we going to sue them to go and rip them out and fix them? I don't want to have controversy going on in this township. If there's a solution, where I can close houses 12 months out of the year, I'm not gonna say a word about it, but right now, got me over a barrel. How the hell am I gonna close houses in uh, the five winter months of the year when we can't pour concrete? That is a problem. I've talked to, I've had meetings with Mike, Andy, your solicitor. They said several things, one, bring up a bond. Well, I told you what I think about bonds. I don't know, try it one day. When do you try to get a bond? Most companies can't get them. So, unless there's some other way, please put a waiver on these sidewalks. I don't want to be sitting in courtrooms and magistrates and everything else with these things. And you sure as heck don't want to be suing our customer or our residents of North Angle Township, at least I don't think you do. So. I'm asking for a waiver on those two subdivisions. They're small. I stand up at uh, Kingsbury sometimes. Matter of fact, I had customers up there the other day. I was up there for about an hour and a half with them. There was not one car passed. And that's why they bought the lots. And there are no sidewalks up there. Yes, the lots are bigger, I agree. Uh, you can talk about things that, you know, waivers and everything else. Basically, I've asked for nothing more in the Brookhaven plan than let me build a subdivision with multifamily in it in an R3 district because the township doesn't have a district to build them in. So if you're saying that you gave me something, you did. You gave me the right to build it in an R3 district. 
And I really asked for no waivers of any kind on that plan, other than a little bit of a vertical curve, which is so minimal it's ridiculous. And the length of the cul-de-sac. I think the township allows 700 feet, if I'm not mistaken, or somewhere around there. And Mr. Turley, I want to thank you. I've got more accomplished in the last couple of weeks than I have in a long time. And thank you, Andy, for doing it for us. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Yes, 
So, I mean, it's an overall thing. I mean, I know it's in our ordinance and that, but I'm, I'm not a real proponent of sidewalks. <laughs> Let me just say this. I'm going to shovel them and everything else. I'll volunteer this. Uh, in a community that I represent in Morocco, they wave sidewalks almost every month. The requirement. Because it's a great idea. I mean, I think from a planning standpoint, you know, if I was a planner, I, I think sidewalks are aesthetically pleasing if they're put in properly they, they serve a purpose but they take up a lot of land they are impervious so that you get more runoff they sink they, they, they create people don't use them like they used to 20 30 40 50 years ago it's just not that kind of market anymore in these rural areas I mean we're not in downtown Pittsburgh um, I saw that the town the council there waving them in on an individual basis. One tract, one person, somebody here, somebody there. And yes, that what happens is then uh, what happens is you've got these little areas of sidewalks and now there's nobody, no sidewalk, and it really looks checkerboard. But that's what that's what that council did and they, they exercised the waiver on a regular basis. Yeah, you brought up a good point as far as runoff. I mean, I'm getting phone call after phone call with these storms because people are putting in cement driveways instead of the stone driveways and, you know, big patios and all the water's running off of it on other people's property. And, you know, now we're adding out all the sidewalks too instead of the vegetation to take out the moisture. Okay. It's everybody's pleasure. We can make it an agenda item for next week if we decide what we want to do. We want to give them a waiver for these sidewalks on these two plans, then it will be on the agenda for next week to be approved. Speak up. You need to speak up so it gets on. Uh, fine because uh, until we find a fix for this I mean you just can't keep people holding people up you know being able to get off the and everything I mean I'm okay putting it on the agenda the only problem I have I think in other developments we always did the bonding process if I'm not mistaken for other developments and I can appreciate it's not maybe easy to get multiple bonds um, with these two developments being I guess called a stack developments I may be more in favor of, you know, possibly putting a waiver out there, but for some of the larger development plans that are, you know, multiple streets, I think the sidewalks are an asset to the community. Yeah. And I say one other thing. The other problem that I'm having up in Buena Vista, these people, most of them are leaving. The sidewalks are supposed to be shoveled. I want you guys to take a ride this winter and go to Lincoln Hills. Probably 10% of the sidewalks are shoveled now. Those sidewalks are impassable. Uh, they're not being maintained by the homeowners. Uh, I guess they could be sued for that too if it's on the slips and falls, I would think. But I've got two small call stacks here. These developments are so small that it's immaterial. And I, the one the adult family, I don't see them out there showing them. <coughs> I mean, it is reasonable to look at these on a case-by-case -case basis.
160 square foot building. It sits up on top of the hill between Route 30 and Post Street. I was kind of surprised when I got up there to see how level it was. Uh, you don't really ever see that unless you get up on top of that hill. But um, Mr. Harrison would like this building to be part of the parcel in the rear that fronts on Post Street. There is a dwelling on that parcel now, although it is owned commercial. Uh, his thought is that somewhere down the road, uh, he may want to split up the um, car lot from the building, and this gives him the opportunity to do that. It would be accessed by way of an easement through the, um, the dealership coming in from Route 30. Uh, stormwater management is, is proposed on site. The only condition on this approval coming out of the Planning Commission is that uh, it is submitted to the Westmoreland Conservation District. They have it under review right now and we're awaiting their approval of the erosion and sedimentation control plan and the stormwater management plan. The other item we seem to be focused on car dealers this month is MC Quality Cars, which is on Route 30, just west of LaDonna Village, uh, on the left-hand side coming up out of the dip. And they have the need for a storage building. They um, keep tires, uh, toolboxes, truck caps, that sort of thing outside uh, when they're either working on automobiles or have decided that that is not an asset to an automobile they're trying to sell. And they've had theft problems, they've had uh, uh, weather problems with things sitting outside in the sun, and it's not the most attractive site with that. So they would like to build a storage building that would measure 22 feet by 30 feet. It would sit right along the back of their uh, show area. It would displace three display stalls for automobiles, but they're willing to do that to get that building. Um, it will be a sheet metal building, uh, almost like a pool building with auger footings into the ground. Uh, this is a photo from the manufacturer. It's not exactly like that, but very similar in size and, and appearance. Uh, Planning Commission had no problem with this. So they recommend an unconditional approval of this storage building. Any questions for Andrew? Okay, thank you, Mr. Blanco. Next item, further board comments and comments? No, not. I need uh, one more motion. Motion in here. Second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I have six to zero. We have an executive session afterwards on or do we have some complaints and he'll talk complaints.